to see faces in the audience again. You know, for a couple of years we did these um, webinars on, as a webinar on Zoom, and uh, it's not easy to just talk to a camera. So I don't know how the newscasters do it. I guess they get used to it. But I prefer to see some happy, smiling faces in the audience. So thanks for coming out this morning. I'm Sandy Vandenberg. I am Director of Planned Giving for the Torrance Memorial Foundation. And um, I bring these uh, seminars to you in conjunction with our Professional Advisory Council. They are a volunteer group of estate planning attorneys, financial planners, CPAs, uh, life care managers, fiduciaries who are um, joining with Torrance Memorial to help educate the community on, on charitable and tax and estate planning. So it's it has been great to, to work with them uh, to bring these educational seminars. And welcome to those people who are on Zoom. We're glad you joined us as well. And uh, we hope that you all uh, will learn something this morning. I want to also give a big shout out to Mitchell Yee. He is part of our media services team, and he's back in the control booth uh, con doing managing the, the Zoom and, and watching for things coming in through that. So this series is called Taking Care of Your Financial Health, and um, so that's what we will continue to work with you on. Um, I have a couple uh, uh, housekeeping um, issues. Mitchell, that's a little bit too dark, I think, for them to take notes. So maybe you can, yeah, that's that's better. Thank you. Um, so if you would put your cell phones on the silent mode so they don't interrupt our, our speakers this morning. The restrooms are through those doors and to the right in case you need to, to do that. And feel free during this um, the presentations to get up and get more coffee or or food too, if you um, so desire. We gave everybody a door prize ticket when you came in. We will do a drawing at the end for some gift cards. And uh, we hope that you you do have to be present to win. So hang around and uh, hopefully you'll be one of the, the winners for that. One of our professional advisory council members, Maureen Dearden, uh, generously donated the funds to help support that. So we appreciate her support. As you came in today, you received the handout for the PowerPoint today and an evaluation form. We do appreciate your feedback, um, so do take a minute at the end to give us some feedback on today's seminar. Um, suggest ideas for uh, other topics. We are in the process of planning for next year. We'll do again the, the five seminars every other month. And um, the form is also a good way to give us your contact information if you want to be sure you get emails related to the various things that are happening. We send out every month an upcoming events and lectures email, which tells you what's happening for the next month at Torrance Memorial. We do save all of the questions till the end. There are some index cards on the tables there. So if you have a question, something comes up while one of the presenters is speaking, um, jot it down and we'll collect those at the end and we'll spend a good amount of time answering questions too that you actually have. Um, for those who are on Zoom, there's a chat box in, on, on the Zoom screen, kind of in the middle at the bottom there. Please enter your questions there, and we will be able then to uh, include those in our Q&A time. I'm always curious about, we get a lot of, I see familiar faces, a lot of you come back every, um, for every lecture, but I'm always curious to know who is here for the first time at this lecture. So... All right, there are a few in the audience, so thank you for discovering us, and uh, we, we hope you will continue to join us. I like to always um, give a little bit of a highlight of Torrance Memorial at, um, for part of the seminar, and this time I thought I would speak a little bit about our affiliation with Cedar sinai It now is about six years old, and it has worked out so well for us to have the support of Cedars, both with their doctors and specialists. We're now able to have some neurologists on campus here who are our Cedars doctors, but they work full time here. Um, some of the cardiologists and various specialists who actually spend time here. So the structure of it now is we are we have joined with um, in the Cedar Sinai Health System is Cedar Sinai and their Marina Del Rey location, as you see over on this end. 
and then Torrance Memorial's health system here, and then Huntington Hospital in Pasadena is also a part of this health system. So it has been a, a real benefit for us to, to have this, as I said. One of the things that it really helped with is that those two medical office buildings next door, the owner of those um, was ready to retire a couple years ago. And so we would have loved to, you know, we didn't have the assets to buy those buildings to make that part of our campus. So Cedars came in and they were able to purchase those two buildings. So now we have that as part of the Torrance Memorial Campus, which will can really help in, you know, years down the line when growth needs to happen and we'll be able to um, do something with that. They will continue to be a lot of medical office buildings, and I think they're, you know, doing some renovations and upgrades and stuff in there, but it, it is um, great and to have them now as part of our campus. Cedars also helped us build the El Segundo multi-specialty building where there's urgent care and a lot of doctors and specialists who see patients there. So it's a, it's a beautiful building on El Segundo Boulevard. And um, so that has been also a nice thing. One of the things that, um, well, here I'm gonna first talk about this. This isn't in your handout. I realized after I printed the handouts, I need to talk about Craig Leach. Craig Leach has been our president and CEO for, um, he's been with Torrance Memorial almost 40 years. And he's been president and CEO since 2006. Well, October 31st is his last day. He's retiring. And uh, we are going to miss him a lot, but I put a picture of his wife there because they are grandparents to seven grandchildren now, children now with two more on the way. And so he is really eager to be able to spend a little more time with his grandchildren and uh, you know, not, not uh, be coming to work here every day. So Keith Hobbs, has been with us since um, for about two and a half years now. And he was named president in February and effective November 1st, he will be the president and CEO for Torrance Memorial. So we're excited to have him uh, take that role. And he was president and CEO at Verdugo Hills Hospital. It's part of the USC system uh, until he joined us about two and a half years ago. So that is the, the plan. Now, with our, our affiliation with Cedars, we still have our own boards of directors. We have a board of trustees and we have a foundation board. And the foundation board is really geared toward helping us raise funds to support the hospital. We're all nonprofit system. And so that is their role is to help us raise money. The board of trustees is more the governance board. It's a little bit smaller. We have about 30 members on the foundation board. Um, and there I think are maybe 10 or 12 on the board of trustees, but we every summer we do a program called vision and it's an opportunity for all of the staff to learn about the latest things going on what the plans are and um, we uh, this video was created about our boards, the board of trustees and the foundation board, so I wanted to play that for you today. several times during the year. Uh, we also have an annual retreat so we can figure out, you know, what are our goals for the coming year. For me, I'm not only a member of the board as are all other board members, but I'm a member of the finance committee. And that role is really looking at all of the expenditures that occur at Torrance Memorial. They do a really good job in educating us board members by having a doctor show up and give us a talk about oncology or another doc talk about radiology and different things that's going on. Very informative. We hear what the hospital has plans for the given year or in many cases, many years out. Like right now, we're doing the emergency room expansion. You know, what's, what does that involve? What does that entail? What kind of equipment is needed? We approve, we support, we listen, and we offer guidelines and maybe input into different subjects that we might have our own background and knowledge in that might be helpful. We get a heads up on, on what's happening and then we can turn around and be a wonderful ambassador out there in the community overall so we can continue to promote the hospital. I think the most important things that board members of the foundation do are to be ambassadors uh, for the hospital so that 
more people know about all the great things going on at Torrance and how highly ranked we are and uh, how different it is than other hospitals. What I've noticed here at Torrance Memorial is it's, it's a team effort. It seems like everybody works together and I'm very impressed with that because that doesn't happen at other places. What I'd really like to get across is how important everybody is in this institution. Um, when we think of hospitals, we think of the nurses and the doctors, we think of administration, but look at all the different departments and what's involved in each department from the techs, from the pharmacy, from the cafeteria, from maintenance, everybody's equally important and everybody has a stake in this hospital and without working as a family we really can't go forward it's really important i mean i think for those of us that live in the south bay having a world-class medical center is so important So it's interesting, I think, just to hear some of their perspectives on their roles on the boards. And one of the things that I also like to share is that Jared and Helena Torrance founded Torrance Memorial back in 1925. And so we are uh, approaching our 100 year anniversary, which we're going to be doing some special events and activities for that. But Jared died before the hospital was opened and his wife, Helena, she continued the, the process and made sure it happened. And Helena built, wrote into the bylaws that women always had to be a part of the board. There's, I think they have to be a third of the board of trustees has to be women. So back in 1925, when women barely had the right to vote, it was um, very visionary for her to see, to, to see how important that was and to include them in that process. So um, it uh, nice um, trailblazing kind of woman who established uh, this hospital. So we are proud of that too. Um, a couple things I mentioned, our upcoming events in Leskers. I always like to mention our Miracle of Living Health Lecture Series. The next one is on September 20, and it's about vertigo and dizziness. Why is the room spinning or why the room is spinning? So that happens right here at 6.30 on September 20. And then we also have a Medicare uh, 101 session that's done by our Torrance Memorial IPA. And uh, Medicare is, you know, gets kind of complicated. So that one is done by Zoom. It's at 6.30, the next one on September 27. I think it's always the last Wednesday of the month they do that monthly. So I mentioned I'm the director of plan giving and I listed up here some of the basic kinds of um, plan giving tools that can be used. The most common is a bequest where you write into your will and trust to give a gift to uh, your favorite charity, which I hope is Torrance Memorial. And, um, and then there are also some income producing type of gifts, the gift annuities, the charitable remainder trust. Um, there's a retained life estate that if you um, don't have children or don't want to pass your home along to children, you can turn the deed over to Torrance Memorial now. You retain the right to live there. You take care of it until the rest of your life. And after you're gone, it comes to the hospital and helps to support the, the programs and services we provide here. So, and then there's the IRA beneficiary. You can name us as a um, beneficiary of your IRA. And I also, another IRA related gift I want, I always like to um, explain and promote is called the Qualified Charitable Distribution. How many of you are taking required minimum distributions from your IRAs? So there are a few in the audience. You can use, if you like to support charity, you can actually give up to $100,000 every year from your IRA to your charity. It comes directly to us from your IRA administrator and it then it doesn't have to be added to your income on your tax return so that adjusted gross income on your tax return is used for a lot of other calculations and so it can save you on taxes more so than if you take the rmd and then give some money away so keep that in mind um, the secure act 2.0 was passed recently and after this year that 100,000 will be indexed for inflation, so it'll start going up what the allowed amount is every year. Um, it does qualify for your for your RMD, and you must be at least 70 and a half years old. So the age for required minimum di minimum distributions to start is going up, and Greg is going to talk about that a little bit. But um, this for this, it's still 70 and a half. 
So, and another benefit is that we consider the IRA as part of your estate plan and we have a heritage society here, which is the group of people who have included Torrance Memorial in their estate plan. And so we, if you do the qualified charitable distribution, we will include you in our heritage society. So that's a group that I manage and we have an annual lunch to show our appreciation. And uh, so we'd love to include you in that. If you have any questions about this, Greg is gonna talk about it a little bit too, but if you have any questions, just let me know. We have a great website um, for with a lot of resources for plan giving that's located here at the top of the screen. And uh, there's a little calculator there that you can play around with some of the income producing tools. And then there's this, this great um, estate planning kit is available on that site. Sometimes it's a little hard to find, so just email me if you um, need some help finding that. But it gives you a lesson book and a record book. And this record book allows you to bring all the parts of your estate to document them all in one place. And it, there's a place to put children and pets and all kinds of things in there. So it's a really great tool. Torrance Memorial is a nonprofit hospital, as I mentioned previously, so we do appreciate your support, and these are some ways for you to, um, to donate to us. But let's get on with what you're here for, to hear about these, um, these great topics. And to introduce our speakers, I'm going to welcome one of our co-chairs for PAC is Larry Takahashi. He shares that role with Karen Pryor, who you're going to hear from today. And Larry is a certified financial planner at his own firm here in uh, Torrance. And this is his last seminar as co-chair because we have two two-year rolling terms, rotating terms, and Larry is just finishing up his second year. So thanks, Larry, for being a co-chair and for being here this morning to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Sandy. Good morning, everyone. So before we start, um, I want to read this announcement and disclosure. This material is for general information only and is not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine what is appropriate for you, please consult qualified professionals. So um, at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, some of the uh, additional PAC members who are volunteering today. So guys, can can you um, come on up maybe over to the coffee station and let me introduce you. Oh, Stephen's over there. Um, first of all, we've got um, Stephen Connors, who is right over there. Uh, Stephen's with the Connors Group. He's a certified financial planner and he's based out of Torrance. And then over on the other side, we have Tom Schlapatha. Tom is a certified financial planner with Morgan Stanley here in Torrance. So thanks Stephen and Tom for helping out today. Today's workshop is entitled Investing, Real Estate, Reverse Mortgages and More. Uh, let me introduce the speakers today. First, we have Gregory Schill, certified financial planner. Greg is co-founder of the advisory group and SEC registered investment advisor with offices in Diamond Bar and Torrance. Greg has been a certified financial planner since 1993, providing clients with financial planning and investment management services for individuals, small business owners, and qualified plan fiduciaries. Greg is a past president of the Manhattan Beach Kiwanis. He has been involved in many charitable organizations over the years in Los Angeles and the South Bay. Next, we have Matthew Moore, probate and trust real estate broker. Matt is a third generation South Bay real estate broker and founder of Wynn Real Estate Services Incorporated. Wynn specializes in consulting and assisting with real estate matters related to the states, trusts, and conservatorships. The company also provides property management services through its division, Win Home Services. And um, last but not least, we have Karen Pryor, certified reverse mortgage professional. Karen is a certified reverse mortgage professional with Mutual of Omaha Reverse Mortgage Division and works from her home office in Torrance. As a licensed real estate broker since 1993, she brings 30 years of residential lending experience to this role, educating seniors and financial professionals about the benefits of reverse mortgage lending as part of a retirement plan is her passion. In addition, Karen is an active member of the Torrance Area Chamber of Commerce, 
serving on their board of directors and also as upcoming co-director of their Leadership Torrance program for 2024. She's in her third year as a commissioner for the City of Torrance Commission on Aging and is currently serving as a chair of that group. So with that, I believe I'm gonna turn it over to Greg. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be back in person. That's much better than the Zoom in my mind. So uh, um, let's hope this continues, right? Well, I, uh, my portion of the presentation is going to focus on stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and ETF investing. My colleagues are going to discuss you know, areas of real estate. Um, my agenda. We're going to spend a few minutes talking about uh, the current market conditions, you know, with stocks and, and uh, mutual funds and bonds. And uh, then I want to spend a, a minute on a really interesting piece of data, the history of bull and bear markets. Then we'll sw switch into an investor focus. I, I decided we're going to spend a good bit of time on the emotional aspects of investing and how it can hurt you, right? And we're all guilty of it once in a while, right? Then we'll switch into sources of retirement income, give you an example of how you can help inflation proof a portfolio and uh, uh, how they interact with the other uh, topics here. Well, first off, you know, we went through uh, the first quarter of 2020, we had COVID and all of the uh, uh, markets, stock, bond, everything, it took a substantial hit. After that, then they rallied substantially and uh, maybe in many people's opinion, too far. Um, then of course, the Fed had to start fighting inflation. They've been raising rates aggressively. You know, it's all over the news. You know, Wall Street doesn't like it because it's, you know, it's ruining their uh, stock market party. Um, but, uh, that's what they have to do. Are they done yet? I would submit that they may or may not be done yet. I, they might uh, wait a, uh, uh, a month or two. Uh, but uh, the Fed governors who've done speeches recently, um, all of them have said inflation is our number one concern. So, um, you know, they remember what happened in the 70s and what Paul Volcker had to do in 80 through 81 and uh, I think they're going to be aggressive on this front. And um, I don't know if we're done yet. I would also add that uh, we might not see any reduction in rates until late next year. So that's uh, interesting. You know, the, the, the Fed is going to be in control. Uh, so what does that have to do with your needs? You know, investing making your money grow, uh, uh, pairing or, you know, how it's affecting your retirement income. I would submit that it's not that important. You know, a lot of this is noise. And uh, let's look at a very interesting uh, bit of data. This is uh, the list of bull and bear markets since 1950. As you can see, the average bear market lasts only 12 months and it has a negative 33% return. The average bull market lasts 67 months and has a 265% average return. So as you can see here, if you're patient and think long-term and you don't listen to the uh, crazy people on TV, right? Uh, uh, you can stay focused on the long term and you will probably end up doing fairly well, right? The key is you have to be patient and think long term. Really interesting bit of data here. I don't know if you've ever seen that before, but it's uh, very telling. So speaking of long term, um, if you are 60 years old today, guess what? You're a long term investor. Even if you want to retire young, that money has to last you 25, 30 years. So it, I would uh, argue that almost everyone is a long-term investor. So you need to not think about those short-term market gyrations. Um, 
The key after that is diversification. Do not put all your eggs in one basket, right? As they say, right? Um, you don't want to have one or two individual stock positions or one asset class in one, let's say, in one mutual fund. You want to be diversified across different asset types, domestic, foreign, small, medium, large, different types of bonds. And with that, you can diversify away company specific risk, right? You're still going to have market risk, the ups and downs. But uh, what you can do uh, to combat that is have a good risk assessment, have a portfolio designed to, so that you can sleep at night with a certain amount of volatility. Okay. Now we get uh, to a point that we're all guilty of from time to time, reacting emotionally uh, to market conditions. And in many cases, we harm ourselves. Um, we've all, you know, seen this with friends, maybe we've done it ourselves, but we have to uh, try not to uh, let our emotions rule our investment strategy. Now, let's look at the, the uh, little graph here. Let's assume that we're an individual investor and the market just took a hit over the last six months or a year, all right? And we cashed out. Oh, I don't like this, right? So the market starts to recover and it's rising. Okay, and um, I'm fearful it's going to drop again, right? So we're, we're, we're out of the market and we stay out of the market. So what happens as the market keeps rising? All of a sudden, the news media is like, hey, you know, boy, the stock market's doing good. Or your friends are saying, hey, my 401k is doing well, and you're st still fearful, right? But what happens? Instead of fear, what happens? Greed, right? Greed sets in because, oh, I'm missing out. I'm missing out. I need to get invested. So at or near a market peak, that's when many people put money into their stock, bonds, mutual funds. So that can be deadly. Um, uh, you know, it depends on the individual. So normally when you market peaks out, they normally peak out, they run a bit too far, and then they consolidate with a pullback. So let's say we start to pull back. Well, I hope it doesn't drop anymore, right? I invested at the top. I hope it doesn't drop anymore. I hope, I hope, I hope. It keeps dropping. And uh, then we get towards the bottom of one of the cycles. And uh, what sets in now? The hope turns to panic, right? What do we do? Many people sell. So what they've done is a classic buy high and sell low. Believe it or not, that is one of the worst things you can do and to, to uh, uh, affect your growth or income needs. So there's been many studies done by large mutual fund complexes where they look at one of their funds, let's say like an, an index fund, like the S&P, over the last 10, 20 years, and it has X rated return on an annualized basis. Then they go and look at the individual investors that have invested in that fund over the same period. Guess what? The rate of return for the individual investors is just half. Because what do they do, right? They're buying high, selling low, or they can't you know, leave it alone, or they get worried about what they heard on TV, right? So the key here is turn off the business channels and think long-term, right? Uh, to drive this point home, Let's go to the next slide. All right. This is a, a hypothetical $10,000 invested in the S&P 500, excluding dividends, from July 1st of 13 through June of this year, June 30th, 10-year period. If you invested in the S&P 500, $10,000, you would have a little more than $27,000. Not a bad return. However, if you were able to miss these 10 single best performing days in that entire 10 year period, 10 days out of 10 years, your return is only $15,000. Look at, the, at what happens if you miss the 20 single best performing days. You almost make no money, right? So the key is you have to think long-term, you have to stay invested because you don't know what day or what rally is the one that sticks and then you go from there right so you need to stay invested through thick and thin 
And again, we get back to uh, one of the worst things that all this research has shown over the decades is that the emotional side of investing where you jump in and out of the market is one of the uh, worst things that you can do to uh, affect your portfolio. Okay, so I think I've uh, touched on that uh, uh, quite a bit. Let's now switch gears into how do we generate retirement income? Well, we have different in source, source, different sources of income. You got pensions, investment accounts, could be an individual, a joint account, trust account, IRAs, Roth IRAs, 401ks, simple SEPs for in, uh, individual uh, business owners. Then we have annuities and investment real estate, which my colleagues will uh, cover. In the past, um, most people had a pension plan, the old style pension plan, right? Then you might've had social security, you had uh, savings if you had other investments and you had investment real estate. Those are the main sources of retirement income over the decades. Pension plans are still available in the public sector, but for the most part, pension plans in the private sector are gone. So what a, what a pension plan is, all right, you're defining a benefit. You work 30 years for a company, A, on that, on that retirement date, they give you the gold watch, and then you get a monthly payment of X dollars a month for the rest of your life. No market risk, no nothing. Hey, a lot of people like that. Well, that's defining a benefit. Nowadays in the private sector, most of the defined benefit plans are gone. They're too expensive. So they've been replaced by defined contribution plans, 401k right? 403B, 457. Um, you're defining the contribution instead of the benefit. So uh, we invest $400 a month into our 401k. Well, then it's up to us to manage the risk, build the portfolio, get the proper growth, right? All while not allowing our emotions, you know, to drive that, right? Well, a lot of folks say, hey, I like the idea of that pension plan option with no market risk. Well, then a lot of folks jump on the uh, idea that, hey, I need to look at annuities. So I wanna go through a few pro and con elements here on annuities. So annuities offer a monthly payment. You write a check to insurance company X, they agree to pay you X dollars a month either for period certain, maybe 10 years, for the rest of your life, or maybe the rest of you and your spouse's life. The longer the guarantee period, the lower the monthly payout will be. However, you have no investment risk, right? You get that payment month in, month out. All your friends are looking at the 401k going up or down or whatever, right? Uh, some people like that. Let's look at the cons. Um, you have little or no income flexibility, right? It, you made a permanent decision. You get X dollars a month. Um, stop and think, let's say you're getting a thousand dollars a month and you just started the annuity. Uh, that thousand dollars a month buys a certain basket of, of uh, goods and services now. What happens 10 years from now when you're still getting the thousand a month? Can you buy the same basket of goods and services? No, right? Could because of inflation. So that's one of the issues is um, you get the monthly payment, but your, your purchasing power goes down and almost all annuities do not offer any sort of COLA, you know, type, uh, you know, increase. Also, you have no emergency cash uh, potential. It's problematic. Let's say for argument's sake, remember, you made the deal with the insurer to have the annuity and the monthly payment. Let's say for argument's sake, you live in the Midwest and uh, you have a bad storm and your house, you know, it gets beat up in the storm. Maybe the roof gets torn off. God help us. I, you know, and the insurance company is not covering all of it. That could happen in the Midwest on a regular basis. Um, the, uh, uh, the issue is you call up your insurance provider and say, hey, I need $50,000, right? They're gonna say, sorry, you have a monthly payment and that's all you're gonna get. Even though you might've given us $200,000, we're giving you a monthly payment. 
you cannot access the funds. It's an irrevocable permanent decision you made to get the monthly payment, okay? That isn't necessarily the case with the stock bond mutual fund investments, and we'll get into that now. There's many popular uh, different tax advantage savings plans. Most of us here have more than one of these. And um, uh, I won't go into detail on this. We can, if you have questions, we can touch on that afterwards. But I'm going to talk and use the term IRA for this uh, next slide um, to kind of include everything. This, uh, uh, Discussion will generally apply to any type of investment account that holds stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and ETFs. Okay. But everyone has an IRA, so you know, I, I just I'm gonna use the term IRA. IRAs carry investment risk, unlike the annuity, right? You know, you put money in, you have, you know, your little, little mutual funds or your individual stocks, and the market does this. Hopefully over time, you know, it, it grows, and that's up to you know the investment strategy and your patience, right, to avoid the emotional side. Uh, IRAs have income flexibility, unlike the annuity, right? You have the ability to make that money grow, right? Um, let's say, um, I can't read my own writing. Let's say we have, uh, we're back to the house, right? And uh, we need money, all right? you can call your IRA custodian or your custodian at your regular investment account and say, hey, I need $50,000. They'll write you a check. Uh, two issues, if it's inside of an IRA, you have to put that $50,000 on your tax return as earned income or as 1099 income in the current year. Uh, issue number one. Issue number two is if you pull 50,000 out of your investment portfolio, that might harm your ability to produce the needed income after that. Right? So pro and con on that, but you do have the flexibility in an emergency situation that you don't have with an old style pension or an annuity, right? Now, you also have the ability to have some inflation protection, but you have to uh, live with some volatility to get that. And let's talk about that. Right. Let's assume, again, it, it doesn't have to be an IRA, but everyone has an IRA. That's why we're using it this way. Let's say we build an IRA investment portfolio that has a middle-of-the-road risk profile, 60% stock, 40% bond. And then we assume a 7% rate of return over the next 10 years, an average. Now, there's going to be years where you lose 5 or 10%. There's going to be years where you make 15, right? Let's say it averages 7% over that time frame. Then what you need for income is you set up an automatic monthly distribution equal to 4% of the IRA value. Pay yourself 4%, right? It's like getting the paycheck, All right? You can set up percentage, you can set up dollar amount, you can have this uh, fine tuned, but here's the key. Um, if we're pulling 4% and we can generate close to 7%, maybe more, maybe a little bit less, what happens to the IRA or the investment account? It's gonna grow to some degree net of what you take out to live on. So guess what? You're gonna live with volatility, but down the road, if you get some net growth, you're gonna be able to give yourself a pay raise in retirement, right? Remember we talked about the annuity, $1,000 now is not $1,000 in purchasing power 10 years from now. Hopefully with this strategy, even though you live with volatility, you may be able to keep pace with inflation, All right? So hopefully I've given you some good uh, items. There is also a SECURE Act uh, page in here. Uh, Sandy mentioned it, for, effective for 2023. Uh, the SECURE Act was passed last year. Uh, RMD start age starts at 73. If you're already taking RMDs, you know, you have to take it at 72 or 70 and a half. Um, in 2033 at the bottom, the RMD start age is raised to 75. Okay, so those are positive developments. There's other elements in here, but I'll pass on that. We can discuss that in the uh, 
question and answer period. So I, I will turn this over to Matt. Thank you, Greg. My name is Matt Moore. I'm a real estate broker here in the South Bay, and I'm going to be presenting on three aspects of the ever-changing real estate marketplace here. Uh, the aspects that I'll be covering are three strategy, or excuse me, three stats that every buyer, seller, and investor of real estate needs to know. Eight challenges facing buyers and sellers, and eight strategies to overcome those challenges in this market of increased interest rates and inflation. And lastly, I'll be touching upon a property management strategy that offers benefits to buyers, or excuse me, to owners of real estate and investment properties alike. Uh, some of this stuff is going to sound like uh, basic supply and demand uh, matters when it comes to the stats, but they're really important to know and understand in relation to how they affect uh, buyers and sellers in today's market. Uh, so let's go ahead and start looking at the stats. Uh, there are three big stats that we're going to look at. The first is inventory levels. Uh, these levels, inventory levels play a vital role in the real estate market here in the South Bay, and they affect buyers and sellers in different ways. For buyers, inventory levels are really their options. What do they have available to them? When inventory is high, buyers have a lot of choices, they have a lot of power. The better negotiating positions, and, and better chances of success. When inventory is low, they have more competition that they're dealing with, and things are a little bit rougher for them, often driving prices up. For sellers, inventory levels uh, affect the competition for their properties. When inventory is low, there's a lot of competition, there's a lot of buyers looking for very few properties, and that tends to have an effect of increasing the speed of sales and rising or raising the, interest, the selling prices. Uh, it also has the opposite effect when markets are low, when, or when inventories are high, rather. When inventories are high, there's much to choose from for buyers in, in the marketplace, and as a consequence, they can be more aggressive in their negotiating strategies and in how they offer their prices up, and that might drive prices down. So again, while this might seem like just basic statistical data that's you know uh, supply and demand stuff, it really does have ripple effects that are gonna affect buyers and we'll see those as we move through this presentation. Uh, the uh, Fed started raising rates in March of 22. At that time, uh, the number of homes for sale on the multiple listing service here in the South Bay uh, uh, were about 627. That number is increased by 25% in that time. So inventory on income uh, residential properties is up. Inventory for income producing properties is up as well, but that number is up about 50%. So it's a considerable effect on the market. And you can imagine what these effects uh, are having on the, the buyers and sellers. Now shifting to days on market, uh, days on market uh, is an important statistic because it tells the marketplace how fast things turn over. Uh, for buyers, a shorter day on market might create a sense of urgency where they have to act quickly to uh, acquire the property that they're looking for. It may also result in higher interest, uh, higher sales prices as well. Uh, on the flip side, a longer day on market might indicate to a buyer that a property has a problem or it may be overpriced. For sellers, understanding uh, days on market is essential when they come up with their pricing strategy. If their property stays on the market for too long, it may be an indication that their pricing strategy needs some adjustment. It might be that they either overpriced their property or there's something that's not right with the property in the eyes of the marketplace. A shorter days on market might indicate that they priced their property correctly or even perhaps undervalued it. In a faster uh, market, the shorter days on market does create a sense of urgency with buyers and raises the emotional aspect of real estate. Since the Fed started raising rates, the days on market for residential properties uh, has increased by about 65%. So it's taking about 80, uh, 80 days for homes to sell in the marketplace right now. For income producing properties, that days on market is up 100% to over 110 days. Uh, that's causing a lot of concern uh, on the part of buyers and sellers and creating a lot of uncertainty. So when we compound days on market with inventory levels, you can see how they affect the bottom line. And that's the last statistic we're going to talk about. And that is 
the importance of selling price versus asking price and understanding where that's going from the perspective of a buyer or a seller. Uh, understanding those things is crucial to the success of buying and selling if you're in the marketplace. For buyers, understanding the direction helps them gauge the market's health. When selling prices consistently exceed asking prices, it may tell a buyer that uh, this is a strong seller's market. Uh, when buyers in, are in seller's markets, as they have been in, in the Los Angeles area and South Bay for probably the last two decades, they have to act quickly when a property comes up on the market that meets their needs or checks all the boxes that they have. Conversely, when prices are selling uh, considerably below the asking price, that might indicate to a buyer that they're in a buyer's market, which is has been pretty rare here in the South Bay. But it gives them more negotiating power, greater options, and uh, gives them a chance to find a better deal. For sellers, the direction of buying price, for, uh, selling price versus asking price uh, indicates the effectiveness of their pricing, pricing strategy. If sellers are consistently uh, pricing their properties uh, and the price the property is selling rapidly, it suggests that they were pretty good about where they placed their property, made it com competitive, or even possibly undervalued the property. On the other hand, if selling prices are consistently falling short or below asking prices, uh, it may be a sign for a seller to reevaluate their asking price and uh, maybe reduce that asking price. Uh, for residential properties, Today's selling prices are trending below the asking prices. Uh, in March of 22, when the Fed started raising rates, uh, a $1 million listing, residential listing, a home, sold for about $1,049,000. Uh, last week, uh, when uh, some a $1 million listing sold, it sold for $1 million. So there's definitely some softness there. Uh, that market went down a lot and bottomed out in the early part of this year and has been slowly increasing but very gradually. Uh, for income producing properties in that same period, uh, selling prices are trending well below asking prices. In March of 22, a million dollar listing, income property listing sold for a million dollars. Uh, this past week, a million dollar listing sold for $968,000. So that's $32,000 less than the selling price of that same property in, 19, in 2022. Uh, that market is very soft and it continues to, to decline apparently, uh, and there's no bottom in sight there as far as we can see. Um, so those are the three big stats, and uh, you can see how they affect buyers and sellers and uh, the crucialness uh, in their success in both achieving acquiring a property or selling a property. Um, inventory levels dictate options available to buyers and competition faced by sellers. Days on market serves as a key indicator for providing insights into the market's condition and pricing versus uh, selling prices versus asking prices uh, is a key indicator of the health of the market. Oops. Okay. So this brings us to um, this, the conditions that buyers and sellers are encountering and and what they're dealing with here. So with those statistics in mind, days on market, inventory, pricing, selling price versus asking price, you can kind of see where a seller or buyer is. Um, there are, those are the ripple effects from the Fed raising interest rates. And some of them are for uh, the purposes of this presentation, uh, the challenges that buyers and sellers are experiencing. Some of the challenges facing buyers are higher mortgage costs. When mortgage costs go up, interest rates uh, are increasing and the requirements to borrow are becoming more stringent. Uh, the ability of individuals to enter the market as buyers becomes more limited. The uh, higher payments on the mortgage cause uh, the ability of a buyer to uh, purchase makes it difficult. It reduces the purchasing power. So uh, inflation uh, diminishes the purchasing power of buyers, making it again, difficult for them to afford properties. Limited inventory with higher interest rates can discourage potential sellers, leading to a de decrease in inventory and heightened competition among the buyers that are in the market. And lastly, stricter loan approval rates. Rising interest rates lead to more stringent loan approval criteria, making it challenging, if not impossible for some buyers to secure financing. There are strategies for buyers to overcome uh, these 
challenges and they are financial preparedness. Buyers need to be uh, prepared financially with uh, good credit scores, increased down payments and savings and reduced debt to enhance their uh, loan eligibility. They also need to be uh, able to make informed decisions. Buyers need to know what's going on to the market. They need to know the statistics that we just mentioned and they need to uh, identify areas where there is better affordability and growth potential to maximize their investment. Uh, Pre-approval, obtaining a mortgage pre-approval to show seriousness to sellers and increase competitiveness in bidding situations is a must for buyers. And lastly, professional guidance. Buyers need to work closely with knowledgeable real estate professionals who can provide insights into the market and help them navigate those challenges. Now, shifting to sellers, There are, uh, facing, there are a number of challenges that face sellers in this sort of market. Uh, some of these challenges are buyer affordability. Uh, with higher interest rates and inflation, uh, the uh, number of qualified buyers is greatly reduced, impacting a seller's property and their ability to sell at the price and terms that they desire. Uh, extended time on market. Reduced buyer demand as a result uh, can lead to properties being on the market for a longer period of time, requiring sellers to be more patient. Uh, tougher negotiations. Buyers are negotiating tougher because they know they're fewer and far between, and that may lead to uh, sellers actually having to take a lower selling price. And lastly, market volatility. The combined impact of rising interest rates and inflation can have an effect on the market that creates vol a volatility that's unpredictable. So here are a handful of strategies sellers can uh, employ to overcome these challenges. First and foremost, they can accurately price their property. It's probably the one uh, piece of advice a seller can use in any marketplace. Don't overprice your property. Uh, overpricing a property det uh, uh, detracts from a, uh, the eventual selling price of a property in most all cases. Property owners can do property enhancements where they can invest small amounts of money uh, to improve their uh, property's appearance, potentially justifying a higher selling price. Sellers also need to have negotiation flexibility. They need to be open to negotiations and flexible uh, concessions that allow them to make a deal with a buyer uh, in, in these markets where buyers are more cautious. They need to have a little empathy for the buyers. Uh, lastly, professional representation. Sellers ought to uh, partner with an experienced real estate broker uh, who understands the local market and can guide them through challenging negotiations uh, that they are most certainly uh, going to encounter. Um, so these are the challenges and strategies that pretty well illustrate what it's like to be a buyer in uh, the South Bay in 2023. It's probably tougher than it's been in a very, very, very long time. Uh, the current real estate landmark uh, landscape uh, represents buyers with challenges and uh, of limited inventory, reduced purchasing price. These things can seem daunting, daunting to buyers. Um, they have the ability to uh, focus on uh, preparing themselves financially, being flexible with their timing, making informed decisions, and they'll be able to navigate the challenges that may be coming their way. On the other side of things, sellers need to adapt to this changing landscape with uh, buyer, where buyer affordability, extended time on market, and tougher negotiations are key concerns. Uh, lastly, in this environment of market uncertainty and volatility, both buyers and sellers should consider the benefits of partnering with an experienced real estate agent or broker. These professionals can offer uh, valuable insights and guidance helping buyers and, and sellers uh, with the, uh, achieving their goals with clarity and uh, confidence. Shifting our focus, let's delve into a specific aspect of all property management, and that is maintenance. While it might not seem like a uh, exciting topic for a Saturday morning, uh, I'll try to keep this engaging <laughs> uh, with a, what I believe to be a very valuable and possibly even a life-changing strategy for uh, owners of income producing real estate and even their primary residences. I've personally seen the benefits of uh, and positive impacts of this strategy uh, enjoyed by clients of our property management company 
uh, where we manage our clients' investment properties as well as their primary residences. Um, at a time when uh, cost on, of everything is in, on the increase, it's important for homeowners and property investors to uh, consider strategies that save them money while safeguarding their investments. Uh, collaborative maintenance uh, is one such prudent strategy. Uh, you're probably wondering what that means. It's, uh, it's a kind of a newer concept, but uh, you've probably experienced it in some way or another in your lives. Collaborative maintenance is, uh, is something that's done in the spirit of community and collaboration where homeowners, neighbors, or property owners of income properties uh, will come together for the purpose of collaborating and uh, uh, joining groups where they source certain goods and services uh, at discounted benefits for the, the uh, benefits that come with that. It's purchasing power, basically. So one example is uh, uh, an annual tree trimming service contract uh, created by property owners in a neighborhood. Th uh, through the contract, all the trees on the properties associated with the co-op are trimmed and maintained through uh, the term of the contract. Some of the benefits uh, and community impacts realized by participants of such a collaboration are streamlined communications. Uh, maintenance typically involves a designated point person of, or committee responsible for liaising with service providers. This streamlines communications and ensures an efficient project coordination. Second, uh, secondarily, negotiating power. A united front helps uh, enhance the community's negotiating power. Contractors are more likely to provide customized services and respond promptly to con any concerns when dealing with a group of individuals. Lastly, cost savings. When neighbors join forces, they often secure substantial discounts. Tree trimming service providers are more inclined to offer group benefits and reduce pricing for multiple properties in the same area often leading to substantial savings. So collaboration not only provides those benefits, but it also has positive community impacts. Some of these impacts are enhanced aesthetics. Well-maintained and manicured trees, for example, improve the overall look and feel of the neighborhood, increasing property values. Aesthetic improvements tend to create a positive atmosphere and a sense of pride among residents. Time savings, coordinated tree trimming services reduce distribution, uh, disruption rather, and noise associated with maintenance activities. This saves residents time and allows for a quieter and more enjoyable environment. Environmental benefits. Collaboration can promote sustainable landscaping practices, benefiting the environment and conserving natural resources. Lastly, cohesive communities. Collaborative maintenance fosters a sense of community spirit and shared responsibility. Residents working together for the betterment of their surroundings build stronger bonds, leading to more connected and harmonious neighborhoods. The potential benefits and impacts of collaborative maintenance are substantial by initiating conversations with neighbors, settling uh, objectives together, and harnessing the power of collaboration. Homeowners and property investors can reap the rewards of cost savings, property value appreciation, community cohesion, and even environmental stewardship. Collaborative maintenance showcases the power of work, residents working together to foster a vibrant and interconnected community. Oh, I'm sorry. So, I, 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 I hope that you uh, find the strategy of collaborative maintenance thought provoking. Thank you for your time this morning. Good morning. Move this down a little bit. Okay, good morning. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, I get to wrap things up by talking about the always boring and never controversial topic of reverse mortgages. Uh, how many people here today know somebody that has a reverse mortgage? Wow, I was hoping for at least one hand. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, the reverse mortgage uh, topic is still somewhat controversial, I will admit, um, but I am hoping to channel Mark Twain this morning and leave you with some worthwhile thoughts for you to ponder. Now, this is the exact same thing as Larry read to you, except in smaller font and with a green background. 
um, we're going to move on to Mutual of Omaha. So how many people grew up watching Wild Kingdom on Sunday nights? Did I get some hands for that? Okay, got some hands for that. All right. Uh, Mutual of Omaha has been in business over 100 years. And one of the reasons that I joined that company was because if a company with that type of longevity uh, decided to invest in a division to bring the reverse mortgage product to their clients, I think it speaks volumes as to what they think of that product and the value that it brings. So today we are going to be going over what a reverse mortgage is, what the process is of getting them, what are some of the common myths and mis, uh, misperceptions about it, and uh, what you can do with it and some real life scenarios. So let's start with the FHA reverse mortgage, the home equity conversion mortgage. Now, there are also jumbo reverse mortgages, but given our time restraints today, we only have a couple hours left, right, Sandy? Um, we won't be discussing the, uh, the jumbo reverse. So the home equity conversion mortgage, which is also known as a HECM, is a unique loan. It's the only loan out there that allows somebody on a fixed income to qualify for a loan that they don't have to pay back until they permanently leave the home. So this is uh, allowing people to get this home on, or excuse me, get this loan on their primary residence. They have to be at least 62. So what are the qualifications? Again, I said you, ha you have to have at least one borrower be 62. If the other uh, person, if the spouse is younger than that, uh, that's fine, but the amount that they would qualify for would be based on the younger person's age. They have to go through financial assessment, it has to be their, again, their primary residence. It can be a single family home. It can be a one to four unit property as long as they're living in one of those units. And it can be a condo as long as it's FHA approved. The amount that you qualify for is based on three factors, the age of the youngest borrower, the value of the home, and then the qualifying interest rate of the program that's chosen. You're able to receive the loan proceeds in a, in a variety of different ways. One is you can receive a lump sum at, at closing, you could get a monthly payment for life for as long as you live in the property. It's known as a 10 year payment. You could also get a monthly payment of a specific amount for a specified period of time. And lastly, you could leave the funds on a line of credit. Now, the line of credit is really interesting because compared to a line of credit that you would go into your local bank or credit union to get, that line of credit, you're going to have to qualify. You get to draw on it for 10 years, it goes into a 20 year repayment. And most importantly, at any time during that draw period, the lender can decide to reduce, freeze, or cancel that line of credit at their discretion. Uh, many people who may have had a line of credit back in around 2007, 2008 may have experienced that. So as compared to the reverse mortgage line of credit, once the reverse mortgage line of credit is established, the value of the property could actually decrease and that line of credit isn't going anywhere. As long as you are living in the property, paying your property charges, main, you know, living up to your loan obligations, that line of credit is there for you to draw on. It also has a growth factor, which means it's going to grow over time at the same interest rate as a loan. So that is not interest, it's not income, it's just the increased ability to borrow more. So what are the safeguards surrounding it? Well, the biggest one is that the uh, Reverse mortgage is a non-recourse loan. That means the property stands for the debt. They're not gonna be able to come after you or your heirs if for any reason the loan balance exceeds the value of the home. The homeowner retains title. However you are entitled to that property is the way you stay in title. There's also counseling that's required. This is a really important piece of the uh, reverse mortgage safeguards. There's a counseling recall call that is required for both FHA and jumbo products. And just to make sure that the borrower understands that this is actually a lien that's going to be placed on your home. They also want to make sure that nobody is coercing you or, you know, trying to make you go get this loan so that they can use the money for themselves. And it is the one of the most regulated mortgage products available. So what are the common uses? Pretty much anything that you can think of, you can use. Uh, the reverse mortgage funds on. Most people will use it to eliminate their current mortgage. So if you do have a mortgage on your property right now, it does have to be paid off by the reverse mortgage. So it has to be the one and only mortgage on the property. Um, people will use it to provide an emergency fund. You heard Greg talking about emergency funds in his presentation. It's very important to have a liquid 
available emergency fund in case that roof does get torn off during the hurricane thing that we had. Um, also, you can purchase a home by uh, using a reverse mortgage. I must admit that's not as popular in the Southern California area as it is in the rest of the United States, but it is something that's been available since 2009. So what are the other common uses? You can consolidate, pay off your debt if you have you know, a lot of outstanding credit cards going on, especially people coming out of COVID. There was a lot of debt that was accumulated. You could pay that off. Uh, supplementing monthly income. So it's important to note that any funds that you receive from a reverse mortgage are not income, they're loan proceeds. So therefore they're non-taxable. So this is something that can really help you manage you know, your, your income situation. Um, I've had people that have uh, decided to use the reverse mortgage to uh, add an ADU onto their property. That is a very popular thing right now. So they're using those funds so for the children who never seem to leave. At least you can get them out of your main house. Um, Long-term care, in-home care, that's a reason. I've got uh, somebody right now who is looking to just age in place. People don't want to leave. So they're using reverse mortgage funds to make sure that they can stay comfortably in their home. Um, funds for travel and recreation. There's a lot of fun purposes that can, this can be used for. And I think we're not used to thinking about utilizing home equity for a fun reason, but some people have decided they want to be able to give their inheritance before they leave. Maybe to have some input on the way it's used. I don't know, but maybe I think it's to see their children enjoy their inheritance before they go. So there is that. Um, and again, purchasing a home, which I'll get into here. So the power of buffer assets. A buffer asset is basically a liquid asset that is not tied to the marketplace. Now this, this graph is really interesting because what it shows is a retired couple who started in 1965 with $1 million uh, had a 30 year retirement ending in 1995. This study was done uh, by uh, Dr. Wade Fowle, who is very well known in the financial planning uh, circles. But the bottom line of the graph shows the distribution of assets over a 30 year period with no uh, use of a buffer asset. Now, during that time frame, there were four years where the market took a downturn. And you heard Greg speak about, you know, the, that the uh, bear is bad. Bear is bad? Yes. Uh, the bear markets don't last long. However, during that time frame, if someone were to use a buffer asset for only one time, only one year during that time frame, you, those middle lines of the graph actually show how much of a difference it would make. So the idea is that if you encounter a downturn in the market, the year following that, you utilize your reverse mortgage for distributions and you leave your portfolio alone. Like Greg was saying, don't panic and take the money out. Just leave it alone and let it recover because it will. So the idea here is to use a buffer asset to let that portfolio recover. And you can see that people who used it, this if they had used it in all four of those years, the results are dramatically different. People think that by putting reverse mortgage on their property, they're going to be spending their kids' inheritance. I hear that from adult children all the time. When in fact, financial advisors are actually realizing that it is another financial tool that can be used to increase the amount of funds that are available at the end of retirement. Uh, the lifestyle home loan, uh, which is the Mutual of Omaha's branded uh, name for their reverse mortgage for purchase. But back in 2009, they realized that people who wanted to pay cash and not have a mortgage payment, they would pay cash for their property and then six months later, put a reverse mortgage on so they could recoup some of that cash. So they decided, hey, let's just cut to the chase and make a reverse mortgage for purchase product. So you're now able to use a reverse mortgage to purchase the property. Um, again, as I said before, it's not as popular in the Southern California area, probably due more to the fact that we have the home values that we do, and especially during these really aggressive markets that we've had, uh, reverse mortgages tend to be, you know, put at the end of the line. So, but it's something that has uh, caught it up in popularity with the rest of the nation. So there was a survey done at the beginning of this year, and they were asked, they asked a group of seniors, 62 and older, what they knew about reverse mortgages. And as we saw from the uh, 
show the tremendous show of hands at the beginning. 74% uh, had really very little knowledge about reverse mortgage products. Uh, and only 2% of them said that they currently had one or were planning to get one. So it's still not something that is being used out there. Uh, there's also a lot of very stubborn, persistent myths that are going on around here. Uh, the first one, which everybody, if I asked you to name one myth, people would say the bank gets your home. Not a thing. They don't. Title remains how title is vested. At the end of the uh, reverse mortgage, when it becomes due, however your estate plan is set up to transfer your assets to your heirs is going to happen. So the, you know, the heirs are left with a debt. No, they're not. <laughs> now, if, if you've happened to have been that couple that started uh, the reverse mortgage and had it for 30 years, it is possible that the amount of the reverse mortgage could be higher than the value of your home, but it's a non-recourse loan. So whatever the value of the home is at the time it's due, if it is insufficient, the lender accepts the value of that home. Uh, the reverse mortgage ends before the last homeowner is finished. No, it doesn't do that either. So if you have two borrowers, if the first borrower passes away, the second borrower can still stay there under the terms of the loan. And monthly payments are never required on a reverse mortgage. The payments that are required are for the taxes, the insurance, if you're in a condo, the homeowners association or planned unit development, whatever the property charges are, are still in place, but there are no mortgage payments required. So what's the process to get a loan? First, you need to talk with a reverse mortgage professional. And I would caution you about just going to Joe Mortgage Broker to ask him about a reverse mortgage, because just like if you needed knee surgery, you're not really gonna go to your general practitioner, you're gonna go to an orthopedic specialist, right? I would hope. You want to go to somebody who is very familiar and does reverse mortgages all the time, because there are a lot of nuances to this product. And if you're not working with it on a daily basis, you're not gonna know all these nuances. They will provide a proposal and walk you through all of your uh, product options. At that point, you need to, if you decide to move forward, you need to sign up for a counseling call. These calls range from 30 to 60 minutes and they're there, they're done by a third party. And the primary reason is to make sure that the senior understands this is gonna be a lien on their property. This is a loan that they're taking out. It's not just free money. Uh, they also want to make sure that nobody is coercing the senior and trying to, you know, get them to take out a mortgage so that they can use the funds. At that point after the counseling, and in California, eight days after the counseling, we can do the application. So we're going to ask for documents to verify your information. We are going to verify your income. Most of the time that's Social Security. So we're going to ask for your award letter or your, ten, your uh, social security 1099. We're gonna ask you for identity documents, your social, verify your social security number. We're gonna ask you for property documents like your insurance. If you have a trust, we want that. If you have a current mortgage, we want that statement. So we have to verify all these things. And once we get those things together, we make sure that you pass financial assessment. So the financial assessment is there to make sure that you have sufficient funds to pay your taxes, insurance, and HOA, like I said, all those property charges, any debt that shows up on your credit report, and then a residual income number, because we don't want you, you know, not having enough money for groceries. So you got to make sure that you have sufficient income. The proceeds from the reverse mortgage can also be used for qualifying. So there is that. Uh, once we verify that you have passed financial assessment, we send it into processing they order the appraisal on the property and it, you know, once it goes through the underwriting process and the loan is approved, then the closing is set up. A notary who specializes in signing reverse mortgage documents will come to your home, do the signing, and then the proceeds are wired to you in the manner that you've requested. So let's talk a little bit about closing costs. Value is very subjective. I have a a borrower right now, she's 95 years old, and she wants to remain in her property. She obviously at 95 doesn't have a whole lot of time left, but it's really important to her that she not disrupt her routine, that she stays in the property that she's been in for, I want to say she's been in there 70 years. It's a very long time. And so, you know, what is the value of that product to this woman and her family? It's hard to put a number on it. Um, 
The reverse mortgage costs are broken down into three categories. There is an upfront mortgage insurance premium. Again, that's for the FHA loans. That's 2% of the home value up to the FHA limit. There's an origination fee, and there are third-party closing costs, such as escrow, title, appraisal, credit, things like that. Remember that this is the only program of its kind that allows somebody on a fixed income to borrow money and not have to pay it back right away. So reverse mortgages aren't meant to be a short-term solution, what they're, and they're, not, they're also not a one-size-fits-all solution. So it's really important that you meet with somebody who can discuss what your options are and what you're looking for and whether or not this will fit into your retirement plan. So let's finish up with some examples. Um, I had a uh, recently wid widowed woman, she's 85 years old. She had bought her home back in the 70s for $100,000, crazy, right? And now it's worth an even crazier amount. So she was considering moving into an assisted living facility. She really didn't wanna leave her home. And there was also the other added aspect of potential capital gains. Now, let me say right here, I'm not an accountant. You need to make sure that you get with an accountant. However, once they penciled it out, they decided that it was actually better for her to get the reverse mortgage, hang on to that property, age in place, and she was able to get over half a million dollars on an equity line to help her get through the time that she had left in her property. Uh, paying off your current mortgage, I had another uh, borrower who is 65. She retired from the LA court system. She did have a pension. Uh, she had not signed up for Social Security yet because she wanted to wait until she was closer to 70, but she wanted to start traveling, having fun with her life. So she had a $1,500 a month mortgage payment that she wanted to get out from under. So we were able to get her a reverse mortgage, not only to pay off the mortgage that she currently had, but it also left her with $50,000 line of credit, which will, as I mentioned before, grow over time. Um, this next guy, <laughs> the retired Navy officer. So uh, when I went up to his house to pick up the documents because he doesn't do the, G the email thing, um, he was in his garage using a power saw. And I'm just like, okay. <laughs> so he was just independent. He had never married, didn't have kids, but he was coming to the end, as you can imagine, at 95 years or 94 years old, he was coming to the end of his funds. So he wanted to make sure that he had enough money to survive. So we set him up with a reverse mortgage that was going to give him a payment. He gets $1,500 a month every single month now, and it has just given him some peace of mind so he doesn't have to worry about it. And hopefully we'll keep him away from the power tools. Um, the last one is the lifestyle home loan in action. So I had a couple, they're both 78. Uh, they had a home that was free and clear that they sold. Uh, they were able to net 875000 out of that, and they wanted to relocate to be closer to their grandchildren. So the homes, they had a new development near their homes were selling in the mid-700s, and they said, well, we can buy a home for cash, but that's taking a lot of our cash, and you know it's only going to leave us a little over 100000 to keep with our retirement funds. So with the reverse, using the reverse for purchase, they were able to qualify for about 300,000. So that's $300,000 that they don't have to take out of the money they netted out of the sale, that they're able to keep in their retirement funds so that they have a lot more security. Holy cow, look at this. Uh, I think there might be a recipe embedded in that. And if you look really hard, you might find Waldo in there, but that's our last of our disclosures. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for coming today. and. Yay. Oh. oh, yes. Questions? Have names on it, so if you, if you want to all come up and answer as they come. Matt, Greg, Matt. Okay. What do you have to do to? Oh, here's two of them. One for you. One for Greg. Okay. Yeah, here's, here's one. We'll start with this. Are there any options for funding a Roth IRA with uh, zero earned income, but a lot of investment income? 
uh, unfortunately, you have to have earned income, right? And that's for not just for a Roth, but for any contribution to a 401k, an IRA, uh, any type of tax deferred vehicle, it has to be earned income, right? So if you have a child, right, that you want to uh, uh, open up a Roth for, in, you have to pay them a salary, you know, to, you know, you know uh, if you own a small business, it's the only way that you can make the contribution. Okay, here's a question for me regarding uh, cooperative maintenance uh, co-ops. And uh, how, how do you find one? Uh, well, actually you create them. And normally what you'll see is like, for example, you, everyone's probably seen this or maybe done this themselves where a plumber shows up at a house and you go, I need some plumbing work done. So uh, you go over and talk to the plumber and you know find out their number and their deal and everything. So essentially that's how you find a collaborative maintenance co-op. If you have a need and other neighbors in your neighborhood have needs that are similar, you can come together and create that group and collaborate. Okay. All right, so uh, regarding the reverse mortgage, if it's used to build an ADU, who benefits from the income generated? And when the borrower passes away, does the ADU belong to the bank? So you can use the money to build an ADU. That ADU is part of the property. That property is going to pass to your heirs, however your estate plan has been set up. Um, so it does not belong to the bank. Remember that the uh, HECM is a non-recourse loan. So if the balance due when the borrower finally passes away, you know it has to be paid off. So the heirs are going to be asked, what do you want to do with the property? The heirs then say, well, we just want the proceeds from the sale which most heirs do. So in that regard, the, uh, the property will be sold, the proceeds that are available will be distributed to the heirs. But if for any reason, the uh, amount owed is greater than the property value, but the heirs still want that property, FHA will actually give them a 5% equity stake, they will be allow them to purchase the property for 95% value. So yay. Okay, I was I was wondering whether we were going to get an inherited IRA RMD question. We have, uh, what age do you have to be to take an inherited RMD? Well, let's talk about the inherited IRA first. Uh, you know, let's say you in, uh, you were uh, uh, a child and your parent passes, and you inherit the IRA. They were past age 70 and a half or 72 or now 73, right? They were doing their required minimum distributions. Uh, you inherited the IRA. So the IRA is set up with your parents' name and you, and you are then required to take IRA RMDs immediately going forward. Um, prior to SECURE Act, you could stretch it over your entire uh, lifespan and just use the uh, single life table. Uh, since SECURE Act has passed, uh, any, uh, if you are not an eligible designated beneficiary, such as a spouse, there's about four or five options. It's like a child is not an eligible designated beneficiary. So we now have the 10 year rule. You, have, you inherit the IRA, you still have to take RMDs each year based on the calculated formula. And you have to have that IRA zeroed out by December 31st of the 10th year after death. Okay. Why do we have to take an RMD for inherited IRA? Because the government wants to collect taxes. Okay. Uh, Sandy asked me to ask you, Mitchell, if there's any online questions. And there are? Uh, yes, there are. Oh. Um, can you please mention general costs and also how the interest rate compares with a standard mortgage interest rate on reverse mortgage? I'm sorry. I, you're going to have to say that one more time a little bit louder because I didn't hear it. No worries. No worries. Uh, <laughs> on reverse mortgage, please mention general costs and also how the interest rate compares with a standard mortgage interest rate. Okay. So the general costs 
are basically what I went over before. There is the upfront mortgage insurance premium. That is by far the largest amount. It's 2% based on the value of the home. So it depends on how much the home is worth up to the FHA limit. Uh, there's also an origination fee, which by law is capped at $6,000. And then there is also third party closing costs. So as I mentioned, value versus cost it depends on why you're getting the reverse mortgage. Uh, as far as comparable uh, interest rates, they are comparable. Uh, the FHA rates are pretty much, I think the last time I compared them, they're about a quarter percent higher on the FHA than they uh, reverse than they were on the FHA conventional. And let me go ahead and take this one. Uh, can you have a reverse mortgage and rent the house? No, you cannot. Uh, unless you're in one to four units, if you, it's a single family residence, it does have to be the primary residence, so you're not allowed to rent. It can only be a rental if, it, if you're living in a one to four family unit. Okay. Um, in the year I turn age 50, do I need to wait until after my birthday to make the catch up contribution? I'm assuming you're talking about a catch up contribution to a 401k plan. No, you do not have to wait. It's just the year in which you turn 50. That's when you can start doing a catch up uh, contribution. Also, um, there is a change with the secure act 2.0 that was just passed. Um, starting in it was going to be starting next year 2024 it's now been delayed by an irs notice that just came out august 25th um, in 2026 beginning in 2026 unless they delay it more uh, anyone who has one hundred and forty five thousand dollars or more in wages in the prior year their catch-up contribution will have to be made as an after-tax roth type contribution all right, that uh, right now you can make the catch up as soon as you turn age 50. All right. There's a question online. Ask yourself to read the question for you. It's for oh, you. Is it one for me? Okay. Yeah. And so we'll give us the next online question. Next online question. Is a pension distribution to an IRA taxable by either the feds or state of California? I, I, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Is a pension distribution to an IRA taxable by either the feds or state of California? It is not taxable as long as you follow basic rules. Uh, what you more normally want to do is do a direct trustee to trustee transfer. Let's say you have a pension and they allow you to take a lump sum and roll it into an IRA. You wanna do a trustee to trustee transfer, meaning you fill out the paperwork for your employer and you say, okay, I've opened an IRA and I want you to make the check for my lump sum payable to my IRA custodian for my benefit. That's called a trustee to trustee transfer. There is no taxes due, both federal and state. You also have the ability to take the cash, um, but in most cases, uh, you are the employers are required to withhold 20% for federal and, and federal withholding. Um, you have 60 days. If you want to avoid taxes and you take possession of the funds, you have 60 days with which uh, it, it, to roll it over uh, to an IRA or another plan. If you don't make that 60 day window, remember you lost 20% too, but you have to make up that 20%. Um, the entire amount becomes taxable. Let's see. Um, mortgage payments are not required, but is it okay to make them? Yes. So I actually have had people who say, you know what, I've got a mortgage on the house. It's all good. I can make the payments. It's not a problem. It's like, okay, put a reverse mortgage on and continue making your payments. So that will do two things. Not only will it pay down the mortgage balance, just like it would on a conventional loan, but when you make a payment on a reverse mortgage, it will increase dollar for dollar your line of credit. So if you make a thousand dollar payment, your in your line of credit will go up by a thousand dollars. So it is money that is available to you. Uh, I don't know how many of you have a conventional mortgage right now, but if you don't make a payment, lenders get a little annoyed. They put lates and stuff on you. And plus, if you said, is it okay if I skip a payment or if I take some money out? Yeah, it's not going to happen. So with a reverse mortgage, you get that cash flow flexibility. Um, 
Is it okay if the line of credit is never used? Yes, you're only gonna pay interest on the money that is utilized. So if you had $300,000 sitting on your line of credit for your reverse mortgage and you never ended up accessing it, you don't owe that back. You only owe back what you've utilized. Oh, keep, keep going. Okay. All right. Sorry. Um, can the property titled under living trust, do we need to retitle to individuals? No, please don't. Leave your property in your trust. However, your property is vested right now. I would say 90% of the loans I do are vested to a trust. So do not do anything differently. We will need a complete copy of that trust. And I mean every single page because that's just what the lawyers require. <laughs> so we do need all the pages of the trust. Um, let's see. Please address the transfer of assets at end of life. How is the asset liquidated? How are funds transferred to heirs? Okay, so when the last borrower permanently departs the home, that can be moving out into assisted living, it could be passing away, it could be selling the home. So when the last borrower is permanently gone from the home, the loan is technically due. It's technically due right then. However, the lenders want to know what you are trying to do with the property. So they'll say, what are your plans, heirs? So the heirs need to get in touch with the servicer and say, okay, so this is what we wanna do. We wanna sell the property. Okay, send us your listing agreement when it's, you know, when it's on and just keep us posted. You have up to a year to transfer that property before as long as you are in uh, touch with the servicing. I had an attorney come to me and said, uh, the lender's foreclosing, and this was a reverse mortgage. And it's like, okay, what'd they do? Well, the son went and lived in the home and started throwing away the mail. And for eight months, he never responded to any inquiry. So lenders get a little snippy when you do that, because really they don't want to own the home. So if you're going to push them into a corner, they're going to say, okay, fine. We're going to have to foreclose. So as long as you're in touch with the lender, as far as what you plans to do with the property, everything's good. If you decide to sell, then again, whatever your estate plan is set up for the transfer to your heirs, whatever assets you have, that will occur. So upon the sale of the home, how, whatever your estate plan says, that's where the assets will go. I think, is that what they meant by the, how is the asset liquidated? It's either by selling or refinancing and paying it off. So if the heirs decided they wanted to keep the home, they refinance and pay off the loan. Uh, does a two on a lot in Redondo Beach held in a trust eligible? Uh, two on a lot, if it's a condo, it can be a problem. And I know we run into a lot of these. Condos have to be FHA approved. Less than 10% of condo complexes in the United States are FHA approved. It's a real major pain. Um, so it would depend on the actual um, description on the property. If it's a condo, you can come talk to me and, and we can talk about it. Uh, can a Heckam glasses on my head. Can a Heckam lump sum occur just before the sale of the home to reduce capital gains above 500,000? Um, so that's an accounting question. <laughs> I'm going to push that right off. Um, as far as taking out the lump sum of money, like say you had that $300,000 sitting on your line of credit. And you know, you're getting close, you know that somebody's gonna pass away and they decide to go ahead and take it out. There's nothing precluding you from taking out that money at all. It's just that that's gonna make the balance owed higher. So as far as using it to reduce capital gains, again, accounting question, so it's fine with me. <laughs> uh, upfront mortgage insurance premium, roughly how much? Again, 2% of the value of the home, period covered, more later. No, it's a one-time charge. As far as more later, there's a half percent added annually to the interest rate. So if the interest rate is six and a half, the, the final rate would be 7%. And actually the funds on the line of credit will grow at that same rate. So that half percent is added. And the upfront is only one time. Uh, how reverse mortgage calculation, I'm not sure. Uh, Reverse mortgage is calculated on the value of the property, the youngest borrower's age, and the interest rate, the qualifying interest rate on the loan. So basically, reverse mortgages are set up 
to be like they're set up as life expectancy loans the older you are the more you qualify for because you're kind of closer to that end date so that's how it's calculated that's all i have okay at what age uh, does the typical pension plan it is the typical pension plan distributed and does it transfer to the spouse upon death if you're talking about an old style pension plan right um some plans uh they have an age 62 retirement date some have an age 65 it depends on the plan document you can have that in a 401k as well so um if you I had this just happen recently, if you have an age 62 um, pension date, we have a, a client who has a defined uh, uh, benefit plan that's frozen. So they're still working, they have their 401k, but they reach the age 62, so they could actually roll that frozen pension benefit over to an IRA. And then when they retire, they'll roll the 401k over to the IRA. And then a transfer is it go to the spouse upon death. All pension plans, 401ks, IRAs, even annuities, they have uh, uh, beneficiaries, designated beneficiaries. And as long as your beneficiary designation forms are filled out properly, uh, um, if your spouse is alive and they are 100% primary beneficiary, they will receive the asset. And uh, um, if you just have a lump sum sitting there, you haven't taken you know, some sort of monthly pension payment, uh, you should be able to roll that money over no problem. My husband uh, passed away and his 401k is currently uh, under his company plan. At what age can I start withdrawing the money? Um, well, you're under 59 and a half, okay. Um, you can roll the money into your uh, own IRA. If you are the uh, sole primary beneficiary, you can leave it there. Um, but uh, uh, the one thing you can do is a little complicated, but there's a calculation method called 72T. And um, uh, not sure uh, uh, if we could do it in a 401k or not, but in an IRA, uh, you can do a 72T calculation, and that means that, remember, in order to start taking money out of any of your IRAs, 401Ks, the government penalizes you a 10% excise tax if you're under the age of 59 and a half, right? So if, if uh, you need money and you're under the age of 59 and a half, you can have the firm do a 72T calculation, and basically what it means is it's an IRS-based calculation that says, all right, you are under age 59 and a half, we're going to set up this calculation. You are going to be able to take money out monthly uh, and uh, live on it, and you're not gonna pay the penalty tax. You'll pay tax on it, but the key is you have to do the calculation with the IRS method. You have to stick with their dollar amount, and it has to last five years, and you have to be past age 59 and a half before you stop taking distributions. Mitchell, anything else online? Nothing else online. All right. Well, let's give Matt, Greg, and Karen another round of applause for a great presentation. So appreciate them giving up the time to prepare and their Saturday morning to come and join us. So we, um, I hope you all enjoyed that. And I think we got to everyone's questions. So if, um, there something else comes up feel free to email me and i'll reach out to our presenters and get answers for you so um tom is our greeter he's a financial planner and so is greg they'll be around for a few minutes we're actually finishing a little earlier today so they'll be around for a few minutes um, if you have additional questions you wanted to ask we have uh, handouts left and so if you want to take an extra one on your way out there on the table there by the magazines and uh, there's also some bagels and food left. If you want to take some of that home, you're welcome to, to take some of that as well. Yes. And Karen also brought some books. What's the, what's the name of the book, oh, Karen? Understanding her 
understanding Karen has a few understanding reverse books if you would like one of those come see Karen afterwards and she has what eight of them so the first eight people to get to her will, can have one of those books so please take a minute to give us some feedback on the evaluation form um, I do read every one of those and appreciate your comments we are planning for next year and so if you I, I will once we finalize the plan for next year of our seminars I'll do a mailing before the end of the year and um, I try to capture e mailing addresses, et cetera, for those who have attended the seminar. So um, if you've received that in the past, that mailing, then you know I have your mailing address. If you wanna just be sure I have it, put it on that evaluation form and I'll be sure to uh, get you on the list to receive that, that. We'll be doing seminars again in January, March, May, July, and September. So every other month, um, I can tell you right now we're starting in January with the individual taxation one that is always so popular so it'll be wrapping up 2023 and planning for 2024 and so that will be how we start in January and we'll do the estate planning and next year the social security savvy social security planning is on the list as well. Um, what else we recorded the the seminar today we will post it online and once it's posted I will email everybody for whom I have the email address to let them know it's available and where it can be found so and um, the uh, there was a question online too that I'm addressing apparently the the screen the PowerPoint wasn't available um, for their viewing so the PowerPoint will be posted online and I can also send it I have the email address for that person who asked that question so um, I'll, I'll send it out again. Uh, I think that's it now it's time to do some door prizes did anybody not get a door prize ticket Do you want to raise your hand when you came in does everybody have a door prize ticket yeah it looks like we do okay i'm going to have our presenters help to um, draw for some gift cards. So, Karen. Okay. So I tore up more tickets than we have people here, so be patient. <laughs> 